And we're joined now by the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Texas Republican Representative Mike McCall. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have a lot to get to with you, but I want to start on the National Defense Authorization Act, which uh, passed the Republican-controlled House, and it was it drew a lot of attention um, this week because of the social policy issues attached to it. So this is a bill. It pays military personnel. It does things that are necessary for national security. Once this goes to the Senate, they're going to chop out all those things. You know that. Right. Comes back to you in the House. Are you confident that Republicans can get this necessary piece of legislation through without having to turn to Democrats to help you get it over the finish line? You know, <clears throat> we saw this actually when the, the Democrats had the majority. They passed a very partisan, you know, NDAA bill, it went over to the Senate. You know, I'm a conferee to the conference committee. And traditionally, the more, uh, you know, less, uh, the more partisan uh, amendments get stripped out. At the end of the day, this always ends up as a bipartisan bill. Uh, you know, but there were some uh, certain policies, like, for instance, the Hyde Amendment since 1980, not mm -hmm. to fund taxpayer abortions that, you know, our uh, members felt was very important to put in there. Well, that's I think that's one well. that will survive. Well, uh, are you t you're talking about the provision that would restrict funding to allow service members to travel. And pay uh, expenses, yeah. But it doesn't, in any way, the Pentagon policy, fund abortions. Well, it, you know, it, I wish they hadn't. Or it, fertility services. Well, they actually kind of started this argument. And look, this is a process. You know, we had a lot of amendments. Our members needed that vote. And I do think at the end of the day, we come together as a conference. And it will be a bipartisan bill. Uh, I think there's nothing more important than our national defense and our military. We give the largest pay raise in 20 years. We mm -hmm. upgrade our triad system, our, our nuclear capability, hypersonics, a lot to counter China and particularly in Taiwan. Uh, so it's vitally important mm -hmm. we not politicize this bill at the end of the day. And I, I feel very confident we'll have a bipartisan bill coming out. Okay, because you did vote to eliminate the diversity offices at the Pentagon to deny transgender troops coverage for hormone therapy for this restriction on funding for people to get um, uh, re reproductive services, including fertility treatments and uh, abortions, to travel. None of that, you think, ends up... Well, because that goes bill. against... Because none of those things will get Democrats. Well, it goes votes. against, since 1980, we haven't funded anything that goes towards taxpayer, uh, you know, abortions. I think some of the policies on culture that the that the uh, Defense Department has instituted has caused problems within our own military. Recruitment is an all-time low now. Uh, after Afghanistan, but, and then to watch these videos that these these uh, trained, you know, mm -hmm. say SEALs have to watch, uh, you know, injecting their own social moral policies. Let's make it about readiness and our yeah. ability to fight a war. Well, yeah, and, and that's why uh, the defense secretary said, what, one in five troops are now female, and that what he put this policy in to be able to do is for them to travel to get things that aren't covered in the states they're living. So should, shouldn't all troops, regardless of where they're stationed, get the same treatment? Like, why penalize them for living in Texas? Well, they're, free, they're yeah. free to travel to another state uh, to have They'd an, be penalized. They'd have to, to take have time an abortion, off. just not taxpayer expense they'd have to take the time off and, mm -hmm. and the like. And so that would impact their ability to do their jobs, arguably, right, if they have to, to go on leave. But anyway, I want to also ask you about one of the things that was in there, or not in there, but many conservative members of your caucus wanted it to, and those were restrictions on funding for Ukraine. Um, what does that indicate about what Republicans will get over the finish line mm -hmm. in the fall in terms of an actual supplemental to help Ukraine. All right. Well, you know my position on Ukraine. We should have a year ago been putting in the weapons we're putting in just now right. uh, for victory, not to, just to survive. Uh, there were several Ukraine amendments. Uh, they they all failed, uh, and I would say the majority of Republicans voted to support Ukraine. At the end of the day, you know the Reagan Institute did a great uh, a great uh, poll that showed that over seventy percent of Republicans support. Uh, Ukraine. I think that was reflected in our vote. Yes, we had about 70 members mm -hmm. that voted against it. But I do think when it comes back, you're going to see a more bipartisan support for things like our efforts uh, in Ukraine, particularly as we're in the counteroffensive. Uh, to me, it's very dangerous to have these amendments when Ukraine is in the crossfire trying to push the aggression of Russia back uh, in the counteroffensive. You're talking about amendments like what Marjorie Taylor Greene was trying to attach. Correct. And Republicans did oppose this thing that we, they... The we did, and, and it failed, and I think that's good news. 
um, you've been pushing for longer range missile systems mm -hmm. like ATACMS. Do you have enough funding in this current allotment or mm -hmm. what you can put together in the fall to continue the pace of weapons? Sure. It was already appropriated in the supplemental uh, last year, you know, the $90 billion. I mean, it's a drawdown authority. We have attackums. So I have great sources on the ground, and they're telling me right, right now, because of the mines and the fortifications, uh, that what they need, the cluster munitions are going to help with, you know, killing Russians in the field. However, they need the longer range artillery to hit the depots, the energy, the the logistical supply lines, they don't have that. And they don't have air cover. And that's, that's yeah. really important here because the F-16s were held back so long mm -hmm. by the administration and the pilot training that they don't have what they need to win in this counteroffensive. And it's really sad. I want to ask you quickly about Iran. You've been vocal in asking the administration for a briefing on the presidential envoy, Rob Malley, and why he is suspended. Do you have any promise that you'll get it, that you'll get information? Well, we sent, I sent a letter. Now, we were rebuked. We have been given no answer about his status. Remember, this is a top negotiator to Iran on one of the most, you know, a nuclear weapons program, yeah. highest classified secrets. So uh, we are giving a deadline of July 25th to have, you know, the uh, diplomatic security and, and uh, management secretary come in and brief us in a classified space. Margaret, I can't tell you how important this is. Because if he somehow, you know, worst case scenario, if he transferred intelligence and secrets right. to our foreign nation adversaries. But there's no proof of that at this point. There is no proof okay. of that. But if he did, yeah. that would be treason in my view.